Good morning. How are you guys doing today? Good, good. All right. So go ahead and open up your Bibles to Genesis 18. Genesis 18. Today we are going to be talking about the justice of God. And really this idea of the justice of God is is God will judge all unrighteousness. And this is important because one of the things we try to do here, you guys know this really well, is we try to share the gospel, right? And what does gospel mean? Good news, good news. That's what gospel means. And this is such an important part of the gospel. You can't forget this because when you start out sharing the gospel with someone, where do you start? You start with the fallenness of man. You start out realizing that we are sinners separated from a holy God and that God will judge sinners for their sin. This is a a fearful thing and it should drive us to repentance. But today we're going to look in Genesis 18. Um, We are going to see how God carries out his justice on a city called Sodom. And really it opens up with with it opens up with God considering Abraham and considering the sin of Sodom and trying to figure out what he is going to do. Not trying to figure out because he knows, but we see kind of him speaking in this way. And so look with me at verse 16 and we'll start there. ...of chapter 18, verse 16, chapter 18 of Genesis. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them and set them on their way. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do... ...seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation... ...and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household... ...after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice... ...so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great... ...and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether... ...according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the Lord is considering Sodom... God is considering the sin of Sodom in light of Abraham and the promises he's made to him. And he says, he says, I want that Abraham has been chosen so that he would command his children and his household after him in the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Really what God is doing here with what we're going to see follows is with Sodom is showing Abraham what his righteousness is. What should, he mo- what should he understand God's righteousness and justice as? And even as we consider God's justice, the reason it's important is because his, re- his love rests on his justice. If God is not a just God, then his love falls flat. It is that God is saving us from his own justice against our sin that we can rejoice ...in his love. So this is so important that God will judge all unrighteousness. You can put this down for point number one. Know that God will judge all unrighteousness. We must know that God is a just God. This is an important part of his character. And many may try to shove this part under the carpet... But this is a very real part of the glory of God. We can't dismiss it. All sin will be punished. And really as we continue through um, verse 22 through 33 is Abraham talking to God and pleading with God. It starts out with, so the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood still before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. So Abraham saying, Lord, you are a just God. If there is any righteous within Sodom, spare it, save it. Don't let your judgment go down on Sodom because you are a just God. And all throughout this next section, it's Abraham pleading with God saying, 
If there's 45 righteous people, will you, will you not spare it? If there's 40, if there's 30, and it goes all the way down in verse 32. Then he said, oh, let, the Lord, oh, not, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. So if the Lord says here, if there were ten righteous people in Sodom, in this big city, ten righteous people, I will spare it. This is important because this is storing up, showing us how wicked Sodom really was. Abraham... Even the perspective of Abraham knew in this time that Lot dwelt in Sodom. And if you guys remember hearing about Lot either in previous weeks or in main service or maybe your parents have talked about or reading through Genesis, Lot was Abraham's nephew. And Abraham knew from past chapters in Genesis that Lot was in Sodom, this place of great wickedness. And so even there he's pleading that, that it would not be destroyed even for the sake of his nephew. And so he was sorrowful. And even throughout this whole section we see Abraham's great humility in knowing that God is just. And asking God to spare the righteous. But now we see truly what is the wickedness of Sodom. And we're going to start reading verse 19 and I'll read through verse 11. And I want us to really soak this in. So I want you guys to get your eyes on the text. I want you to see it. And I want you to understand it. Because this is showing us the unrighteousness of the people of Sodom. Verse, or chapter 19, verse 1. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. Lot is ne Abraham's nephew, remember. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they called to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do, no, do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand back. And, and they said, this fellow came to sojourn, talking about Lot, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they, pressed him hard against, or then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. So the wickedness of Sodom is so clear here. You see the hospitality of Lot bringing these angels really into his home taking care of them in this wicked city, not wanting them to dwell in this square because of the wickedness that takes place there. And these men come to the door and start harassing him, saying, bring these men out, bring them out so that we may do wickedness to them. And even Lot, not showing the most discernment here, says, take my daughters and do whatever you want to them rather than take these men. So the wickedness seen in these men is great. And really... What you see from the previous section, where Abraham's talking to God and pleads down to ten men. What the, what the writer is showing us here is, God said, I will spare it if there are ten righteous men. And it's tested here. There are not ten righteous men. The wickedness of Sodom is clear in this passage and this really was a test from God to test Sodom before he destroyed them. They were storing up for themselves the wrath of God. But I don't want us to look at this passage 
or any of us to look at it, as we just did, got our eyes on the text, I don't want us to look at it and think, Sodom is so much worse than we are. Sodom is unholy and unrighteous, and the wrath of God is on them. But I'm good. I don't do the things that they do. But what we realize all throughout the New Testament is God looks at the heart. Where's your heart? Is your heart in wickedness? Are you disobedient to your parents? Are you doing things that the Bible clearly says not to do? Because if we truly believe that this is God's word, and he tells us not to do something, then you are disobeying the very God who created you. God is justified in punishing those who are wicked. And this is so important to the gospel. Romans 1 says the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness. Any unrighteousness, the wrath of God is revealed against. And this, this puts us in deep, deep trouble. Romans 3.23 tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all partook, partaken in unrighteousness. Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. That's a punishment. But I want you guys to hear the plea. God will not leave your sin unpunished. The question is where is it going to be punished? Is it going to be punished on the shoulders of Christ or on your own? This is hard, a hard thing to digest, but we have to think on it. You have to think on it. Hear me when I say this. All sin will be punished. It only matters whether it's on Christ's shoulders or your own. If you put your faith in Christ, if you repent of your sin and turn to Christ, your sin is taken off of you and put on to Christ. You trade. You have dirty garments. And you trade your dirty garments with Christ's righteousness. And you put that on and you stand before God in the last day. That's the hope. That's the hope. That's why we get up here and preach. That's why we get up here and teach you guys the word. That's why your parents at home are teaching you the word. Because they're pleading with you. Have you repented? Have you put your trust in Jesus Christ? He is the hope. He is the hope that we have. In this passage in verse 12, chapter 19, starting in verse 12, if you look with, it, look with me there now. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? So this was right after all these people are trying to get in the door and, they, and the angels cast blindness on these men. And there's a moment of chaos, but the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone else haven't... Son-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone else you have in the city, bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people have become great before the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Sodom failed the test that God gave them. They failed it. Their, dis their hearts were sinful, longing after sin. And really here, he gives a warning to Lot. There were not ten righteous people in the city, but the New Testament speaks of Lot as a righteous man. Though he's not the most discerning in the decisions he makes, God decides to preserve him, and he gives a warning. And so you can put this down for point number two. Heed the warnings of God. God is merciful to give us warnings. Week after week... Your parents bring you to church to hear the word, to fellowship with one another, to enjoy the fellowship of believers, but to hear the word, to sing the word. These are warnings. These are gracious warnings from God saying, repent and believe. Repent and believe. And that's what we tell you guys week after week is repent because it's so important because we enter into the joy of salvation and the love of God. So heed the warnings of God. Verse 13, or verse 14. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out of this place. The Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his son-in-laws to be jesting. Verse 15, as morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. 
Here we see the angels are coming to Lot and saying, leave the city. It is going to be destroyed. It is going to be destroyed. They're warning him. But even here, his son-in-laws laugh at him. His son-in-laws say, that's silly. And that feels very familiar. For you guys, if you're in your school or elsewhere or talking to different friends throughout life and they think that you going to church is silly, that's the same thing here. We're not to listen to the world and say, oh, they think it's silly, so I, I, it's probably silly. No, God is warning us of the importance of this week after week after week. And we have to respond. We have to respond. So even Lot here, lingering, he gave in to the temptation to be influenced by his son-in-laws. 1 Corinthians 15.33, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. We have to be aware of this. Who's influencing you? Who's influencing your thoughts about church or about Christianity or about the Bible? We have to be aware of that and we have to keep ourselves from that. Uh, verse 23. So it end, or yeah, so verse 23, we'll jump down to verse 23 here. Verse 23 says, The sun has risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. So this is the follow through on the judgment of God. Their sin was great and he was going to judge it. Verse 25, and he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the, gr and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And this is actually important if you hop back up to verse 17. Verse 17 says, and as, and this is the angels speaking. Sorry. Yes, that's right. Uh, about to be. And as they brought them out, one said, escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills lest you be swept away. And down here, verse 26. As they're escaping, Balat's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. God gave a command and she disobeyed it. And she turned into a pillar of salt. They said not to look back. And so we should take that and take it as a sobering reality and marinate on it and think about it. Even it ends here, verse 27. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. God follows through on his justice and he will follow through in the last day. So we need to heed the warnings. It's clear that God will judge in righteousness. But Christ provides a way out. This is the hope of the gospel. I don't want you guys to think I just come up here and say judgment, judgment, judgment without the hope. There is no hope without Christ. Christ is the only way. He says he is the way, the truth, and the light. He says if we repent of our sin and we turn to Christ and put our faith in Christ, we will be saved. We will have salvation. Our sinfulness will be put on the shoulders of Christ to be punished on the cross. And we will gain his righteousness. That is the grace of God. Even we don't know what day we're going to die. We don't know if we die today. We don't know if we die on the drive home. We don't know when it is we're going to pass. And that's why today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Repent and believe in Christ. He is so worth it. Remember, God's justice magnifies his love. That's the joy of this, is that we realize that God's love is so great that it overcomes all of our sin. Hebrews 9, 
27 through 28. And just as it is appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. That's the hope that we have if we're in Christ. We are eagerly waiting for him to return. And so I'd encourage you, think on this. Don't just forget as we walk out the doors of church. Consider this. This is important. And so consider that. Today is the day of salvation. Repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for your word that we get to understand it. God, there are some hard truths in your word, but Lord, I pray that we would receive them with joy and we would realize that the judgment that you carry out on unrighteousness, Lord, is a good thing. It is holy, it is just, it is righteous, and it magnifies the love of Christ. So God, help us to consider this, to mull over it, help us to wrestle with it and to know the truth of your word. And God, I pray that this um, sermon would just be a blessing, Lord. Um, that we would all come to understand your word more and more. I pray for small groups. I pray for attentive ears. um, And I pray all this in your holy name. Amen.